Stuart Copeland from the police called this guy a Swiss Army knife. He is a producer, a songwriter, an engineer, an instrumentalist, multi-instrumentalist, Katy Perry, Adele, Deftones, an incredible talent, a Canadian. Folks, put your hands together for Greg Wells. Yay! And a Pensados Place regular, I might add. Absolutely. And a good friend, somebody I've admired before I met him and worked with him years ago. Man, um, Atlanta copping, like jet setting, world traveling, Abbey Road, incredible. Yes. Uh, this was your second trip back to Abbey Road to do the... Uh, well, first of all, listen, guys, Avid is having a contest where you get to submit a song. Can you fill us in a little bit on that, Greg? I, do you know all the details? I'm not fully up to speed yet. I don't think I know all the details, but, but me and two other uh, judges are going to pick our favorite song. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you do Hunger Games at Ab some of the stuff from Hunger Games at Abbey Road? Am I thinking wrong? Uh, I did... Um, for the better part of a year, I was working on this English artist, Mika, his third album, which took forever to finish. And uh, I did a 14-hour string session there uh, last August. Wow. And that was my first time there. And, and I, as you know, I, of course, have to launch into a tangential related story, but it was my first time at the studio. And the, the room that they booked was Studio 2, which is the room the Beatles did all their wow. stuff in. And uh, did I tell this story already? I, I, hear it. I, that, they don't know it. Um, within the first 45 minutes of being there, and you know, and there's the upright piano that McCartney wow. played. There's everything. And then there was Paul McCartney himself. No, no I'm not didn't kidding. Tell that. Colette. Col oh, he Colette. Was at the studio. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> We, uh, I was, he lives there then, huh? Well, it was, <laughs> I don't know what happened. It, 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 we, we, we ordered some sandwiches, and the studio manager came in, and she said, I see you're eating some sandwiches. And, yes. Um, well, we have somebody that needs to come in through the back entrance. Um, it's Sir Paul McCartney. Do you mind? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, are you kidding me? Right, exactly. You know, we're in the Beatles room, and a beetle, and he walked, he's like, hello. Hello. Oh Very nice. Uh, and is he, that inspiring or intimidating? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. A lot of both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He was actually, he was quite totally cool. I have to say, he was really, he was really sweet. He was wow. in and out. He was there to fix, there was some technical debacle that had happened when he did the, uh, the London Olympics opening. Uh, uh. And uh, they were going to try and fix something in post for the DVD release. I think that's what he was, what he was doing. Wow. There. So he was Very a bit cool. like, oh, I got to. Very fix cool. a problem. My friend, I was talking to uh, Russ Hughes, and Russ actually filmed you recording a band there recently that's going to enter into the contest or, or be part of this Avid contest. We'll, we'll get the details of that to you. How is that like actually recording and tracking a band? I think Russ said something that uh, you actually used a microphone and that, that, uh, that McCartney used on one of the big hits and it was a little intimidating or something. I don't know about that. I'm sure we did, you know. I mean, when you walk in, in the hallway is one of the, um, uh, oh, again, blanking on camera, what's it called? The, uh, the TG Mark II consoles. So, uh, you know, and then, and then there's one of the reel-to-reel -reel four tracks. It's not, it's not one of the ones from Sgt. Pepper. They keep those in a closet, but it's the exact same model. Um, so you're just immediately hit with, like, holy grail stuff. But right. what we did do, um, we mixed the song in Studio 3, which is a more modern, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful studio. But they have uh, the Mark III e version of the EMI console there. Again, looking like the inside of a 747. And I ran everything that we'd recorded through the console, uh, except the bass. For some reason, the bass sounded better, but I mean everything, vocals, drums, everything. And it was... Amazing. It was amazing. Wow. No EQ, no com just nothing. Just, and I made sure we matched levels when we were comparing, you know, because louder usually sounds better. And, and we kept going back and forth, and it was just jaw-dropping the difference that it made mm -hmm. and uh, I've never heard any other piece of gear do that. It's wild. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's 
Amazing what he was referring to, or something yeah, like that. Nice. Guys, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna philosophize a minute. Uh, it is Pensada's place, so you can't stop me. Um, when you hear us talking about Paul McCartney, some of you younger cats, when you hear us talking about Abbey Road, you might say, I don't care about those legends, but you should care, and let me tell you why. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I've learned in life, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty good with physics, pretty good with chemistry, but one of the ways I learned those subjects was through the history of that particular, like with physics, you go back to, to Newton and you work your way forward, it's much easier to learn something when you take the history of it and learn it because you can learn it in small steps. I was blessed to start out with computers back when it was a, uh, an 8080 processor and the machine language just only had a few hundred like uh, lines of code. And, and so it's easier for me to progress and pick up. Like, like my wife just learned computers last year, and it's a pretty daunting task. Now, Greg and I, not, not only do we love engineering, we love everything about it. We love the history. We love the process. And, and for you cats that are working at home on your, on your own, one of the things that Greg and I did is we, we, we learned the history and we came up. And so we stand on these people's shoulders when we do what we do. You might not like the music but you owe a debt to the people that came before you. And if you, can, if you can learn from cats like Greg what it was like to be at Abbey Road, that translates to the same energy that's gonna go into everything he does since he's been there working in his home studio here. Apply that to you, so that's the importance. Like, I'll give you an example. If you don't know that Sgt. Pepper's was, a, was an album that was groundbreaking, that's because Everybody copied it so thoroughly since then that it sounds normal to your ears. But if you were alive when it first came out, it's a different story. And that's, that's why legends are important, not necessarily because of the way they sound to you today, but because of the fact that without them, what we do and love would be totally different. Right, Greg? That is so brilliant, everything you just said. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Oh, thanks. It's so, I mean, it, it reminds me of... of two things. One of them I think I just forgot, but um, like Stravinsky, I'm a huge Stravinsky fan. So I've tried, and mostly successfully, to turn so many people on to The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. Which that was, was my written, mother's favorite piece. It's, it's, and rightly so. And it's 100 years old this year. Well, it debuted in 1913. Maybe he'd been writing it before that, but um, but when Oh, I know what the second thing I was going to say. I'll say them both. I'll try to. Uh, when, when kids hear Stravinsky, they think Bugs Bunny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because Carl Stalling, who wrote most of that music for the Warner Brothers cartoons and did an amazing job, freely took from Stravinsky. And it sounds overcooked and sort of like, you know, a lot of people. Um, I had another experience where I used to play with um, the singer Katie Lang when I was 23. That's I was where in you her did your start. Yes, she was a huge uh, early... And an incredible artist. Oh, one ridiculous. of my favorite singers ever. ever. Yep. Uh, and one of the best live performers I've ever seen. And she kept telling me, you've got to discover Joni Mitchell. You have to discover Joni Mitchell. And I, and I tried a few times, and I just, I just didn't speak to me. It, I just couldn't... I didn't get it. And, and, then, and she actually lent me her personal copy of, of Blue, which I think I still have, wow. a CD. And she said, listen to this until you love it. <laughs> and I thought, it's a bit odd. That's neat. That's and she nice. was right. And I pushed through. And I can, I can still listen to Blue from top to bottom and never get bored for a second. I probably heard it, I don't know, a thousand times now. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, she was right. It's like learning. It's like studying Shakespeare to a degree. You know, when you go see, I remember going to see Kenneth Branagh uh, do, um, I forget, I think it was, I don't remember. It was a play I wasn't familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd studied Macbeth, so I could go see Macbeth, and I knew what was going on. I hadn't studied, and I was so frustrated at the end of the performance, going, what the hell did I just see? What is going on? But you have to do the work and learn the subtext and study the language and get the thing, and, then, and it is so enriching. Let me ask you something, Greg. Like, like going back to my tirade about legends, um, when, you, when you approach something like... like um, a classical piece, um, which I think we should all do. I'm not a big fan of classical, nor am I a big fan of jazz, but I listen to it. 
and I think it's I think probably approaching that from a historical perspective. I, I was blessed because my mom was a fanatic. She loved she loved student, uh, Rimsky Korsakov also. She loved all the nationalist type classical people. But, um, I wanted to remind you guys, Sergeant Pepper's. Uh, well, you know what? Right now, if you get the if you get the HDX system, you got eight million tracks. The old uh, um, HD system was 192. Sergeant Pepper's is a groundbreaking record. It changed the way we thought about making music, and it was done on a four track. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Four track. Now, how'd they do it? They used two four tracks. And they would they would record this one. They'd bounce some stuff over to here. Then they'd record on these two. Then they'd go back and back and back. That's mind boggling. And, and 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 they created that with four tracks. And you ain't doing shit with 192. Come on. That's why you that's why you got to pay attention to the legends, because we can learn from this stuff. Greg, people are gonna hear. What was the group you recorded? Do you remember the name of the group? Uh, they're called Strange Fruit. Strange Fruit? Yep. Okay, you guys are going to hear this pretty soon, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions about that recording process, and when you hear it, then make notes, because I'm going to ask him how he did the, the vocals on that, and then when you hear it, you'll know how he did it, and that, that'll be a learning moment. Can you, can you describe the, the signal chain that you used, the mic, all the way into the console that you used? Um, I'm pretty sure I can, yeah. Uh, I... First of all, this singer has got a, the, just a fantastic, big, full voice. And so I thought, let's get a 47. Um, and the engineer, Chris, who is a very talented Abbey Road engineer, he said, you know, I know what you mean, but the 67 that I picked out is really something else, and you should at least hear it. Uh, so we did, and he was right. Uh, it just sounded incredible. And... Actually, I have to say, because we were under a real time uh, schedule, we had uh, two days to record, to finish recording everything on the track, wow. and a day to mix it. Wow. So I couldn't go too crazy with, you know, mic shootouts and stuff. And once, and I, I realized within about five minutes, this, this, the engineer that we were working with was excellent and really knew all the gear at Abbey Road inside out and backwards. And so I, I leaned on him quite heavily. And, and because of that, I can't, I'm not sure what, what happened after. I just remember that mic selection was a 67. Um, I think he, I think the pre was the console. They have a Neve, newer Neve in Studio 2 at this point. A, 88R, is that right? I can't remember names. Yeah, I think it's the same one they had at, uh, at Skywalker. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you guys saw the Skywalkers, the same one as that. One. I'm not good with with that stuff, but um, and then um, you know probably 1176 compression. Nothing really kind of on the compressor. If I'm driving you nuts with this stuff, but you know no. me, I, I I've been driving you nuts for 20 years. <laughs> what, would you remember what the ratio was on the compressor? Four to one. Uh, it, it, for me, it's either four or eight. And then and then. Because now we all have plugins. The the input knob was at like ten o'clock, eleven, twelve, one. I don't remember. I don't remember. And in fact, we might have actually used a second compressor as well. I think I might have. It might have been eleven seventy six and LA two A. I'm usually recording vocals now with two compressors. In general, when you when you record vocals, do you? How much time do you spend adjusting the attack and release? Do you, do you uh, quite a bit, right? It matters a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, generally, um, uh, including with, with mixing, at least for me, I, on 1176, I like either the slowest attack, which is already pretty fast, mm -hmm. uh, or kind of like 11 o'clock, you know, um, for tracking, always slowest. And, uh, and, and on release, which bugs a lot of engineers, always fastest. I just I like the sound of that better. I like um, I feel like when when the release is a little slower than that, I'm losing some of the. Do you do do you pay attention to the release time on that particular song for the tempo, or just just went for it? I think the only times that I don't choose the fastest release time is if the song is really slow, 
and then the fastest release time just sounds too aggressive. It's too kind of, you know, caffeinated. And, you know. And, and, and because you have the luxury of mixing what you tracked, like, much like our audience, how much effort do you put into the compression while you're tracking as opposed to mixing? Do you try and save most of it for mixing or most of that compression for track? In other words, do you, do you track, would you describe your tracking compression slight, little tiny bit moderate, and then when you mix, you do the, the heavy lifting? Or uh, I, really, I really ascribe to the Daniel Lanois school of recording, which is print the sound you want to hear oh. at the end of the day, or try to, at least, you know, and, and then all, 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 inevitably, in the mixing stage, it will, it will probably need to become something other than that, but I don't come from, I know there's lots of producers that won't even print compression. They'll monitor it, but they won't record it. And I, I don't know why, but I really like to hear things sounding record-like from the get-go, if I think, possible. I think in a Pro Tools world, I think you should print what you want to hear. I think saving it for the mix is so 80s. I mean, that's just an outdated concept to begin with. I think you should print the way you want it to sound, and I think it's okay to deliver it to a guy like me the way you want it to sound. And I think that's a modern concept. I like, I like getting, now, I like getting a project where you left off, and then le and because guys like Greg, they know what they want. When they like like in the '80s, when some or in the '90s, when somebody would bring me something to mix, it was 60% of what they wanted. But now everybody's got Pro Tools. When you get a when you get a something to mix from a cat like Greg, the few times he does go to an outside mixer. It's 100% what he wanted. So you finish the mix part of the process for him. Now, when you're at home tracking, you're, you're, you put a plug in on, you're, you're mixing already. So what he says is very valuable because there's no distinction between the tracking part and the mixing part these days. And I think what he said is, is, is dead on. Let me ask you a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add to that that. Um, I wouldn't have the confidence to, to do that unless I knew I was in a room uh, where I was really hearing what I was recording. You know, if I was yeah, working on speakers point. I didn't know or a room that wasn't tuned, I'd be more scared to commit to your, that. Your, your home studio, you're pretty confident with that, right? My studio is not at home. It's, uh, it's in a warehouse in Culver City. I'm in a project studio. I'm it's sorry. like a, it's a, yeah. I, what um, monitors are you using there? Uh, B&W 802 Diamonds, oh, which wow. are like super revealing. Uh, they're more mastering speakers, really. I mean, you can't, nothing hides. It's everything's there. A lot of people would hate working on that stuff. Um, yeah. And, uh, what are your near fields? Uh, I, That's all you use? Yeah. <laughs> well, what I was going to ask is, as a producer, is there a, a Greg Wells signature either that you're going for or people notice about your production work? Is there anything that sort of defines your style? Uh, I've, it's hard for me to... Uh, it's hard to be objective I, about yourself. I'll just tell you what I've heard other people say. Yeah. Which I can, you which want me I, to answer it for you, Greg? I can answer it for you. Well, he was You'll do answer. a better job than, okay. than I will. A, a, a Greg Wells vocals... There's some vocals you hear in the in the sound and the and the performance don't match the lyrics. A Greg Wells vocal is is like a well tailored suit with the perfect tie. The per everything matches. The energy of the performance matches the sound. Everything is is coordinated in such a way that you get apologized. That you get the Katy Perry hits. You get God. You guys got to buy the new Mika album. It's like it's a perfect answer to this question. Some guys record the vocal to make it sound good that's where you start that's where Greg starts but all his vocal performances that's why when, when Herb delineated the list of people he works with that's why they like him the one thing those people have in common is that they, they're singers they're performers Adele and, and, and Greg is, is so he's a field cat so, so that's what you that's what I I study his stuff because 
in the as a mixer I want to make sure I don't destroy that and and so when I compare my mix to a song I pick one of his so that I make sure that that energy that I'm that I'm enhancing it if I can and that's what that's what you do that's why you're on this show that's why you're looking at me stupid. <laughs> so, so my question is, is that, is, that what, is that what people say? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, not as eloquently as that. Thank you, by the way. Um, I mean, I, you know, m my answer to, the, to that question is I just try to get out of the way of everything that's great mm -hmm. and protect it and keep it ticking. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard other people say that uh, I... I, I do or I attempt to bring out the best of an artist. And, and, and certainly that's when I walk through the studio doors, I feel like, because I like, stylistically, I like to change it up a lot. Um, and I feel like I'm kind of sunk unless I'm working with somebody who actually already is a really compelling right. artist. Right. Um, and, and if I'm lucky enough to be in that situation, then you know, a quote that I've used on, on your show before, where Ray Charles said, every music has its own soul. Mm -hmm. Say that again, I didn't hear it. Uh, Ray, one of his fa most amazing quotes is he, you know, Ray was a fan of, he made country records, he, yeah. made all, he liked all kinds of music. Uh, he said, every music has its own soul oh, to wow, it, that's its cool. own soulfulness. And I, I, know, I, I know what that means for me. Uh, and so I, if I get it, if I resonate with it, then I, I just try to chase that vision and tell that story. You know, I'm not the storyteller. I'm the movie director mm -hmm. of the person telling that story. Um, and it's not about me. That's the one thing I'm super clear on. I wasn't clear on that when I was a kid. It, it, there was a lot more ego kind of driving the whole thing. But once that sort of chilled out in my 20s, yeah. um, it really, the thrill was like, you know, giving buoyancy to someone else's. Did your experience a, immersing yourself in the in that? Um, what was the record that, that that Katie told you she wanted you to listen a lot? Um, there's been there's been a few. Um, uh, Joni Mitchell. In most immersing yourself in that Joni Mitchell record, did that enhance that ability to suppress the ego? Is, is that something that they could get from that? <laughs> The, the thing that suppressed my ego the most was... Um, was your, your, self, your, your first album? It was my, my one and only album, which, thank Soul God, record. none of you will hear, and I will see to it that none of you will. He hates his... We never heard it. It never came yeah, out. Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, uh, but once I realized that there are just, you know, people... When I was trying to sing, if you could call it that, and... Uh, the, you know, once I started working with people that were li like literally a thousand times better than me at doing that, I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So as Dave prepares for Batter's Box, just a quick note for you guys. One of the things that we all have to remember all the time is we're in a service industry. You're really servicing the artist, you're servicing the project, and if you bring that spirit to what you're doing, which can be hard when you have all the tools. You, you have all the tools enough to think it's you, but it's really about how you're servicing that. So when you want to get to the level of where these guys are, or if you're a businessman, whatever the case may be, where I've been fortunate enough to be, remember, you're servicing people. You have to keep that mindset. And you, and, but it doesn't mean lose your ego or your ambition. It just means put it through the service lens and then shoot for greatness. So you can't be afraid of that. Otherwise, your own lack of ambition will keep you down and not understanding the big perspective. So service through service will come greatness. Now it's batter's box time. We're ready for batter's box? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll shoot some and we'll see what happens. Greg has been a little under the weather. Uh, we're lucky we got him today. He, he's been recently s suffering with high fevers and stuff, so um, I'm gonna slide this in on him. If he doesn't wanna do it, we're gonna do something else. But can I name a, a, a genre and just Stream of consciousness, Freudian style. Just name a, your, a song that comes to mind. Doesn't have to be your favorite song. I'm on Excedrin right now, but we can try. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and, and I, because because of the um, we so, do have a Pensado's place uh, illness mulligan, so I'll, I'll allow you to come back to. I'd one like later, to add. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so tell, to ex explain it one more time. Okay. I'm just gonna say I'm gonna say like country music. Okay. And then and then and then you say. Any, any Katie Lang song, or you say, 
the more I learn about women, the more I love my truck, or any other favorite country song. That's that the one. That, <laughs> <laughs> that should be a whole episode. <laughs> Come on, how about an applause for me? I set that one up perfect, didn't I? Show's over. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Try the bill. I'll, I'll say, like, I'm thinking Shoot. classical pop country, so I'll just, just whatever comes I'll to mind. Here we go. Yeah. It can be a song or go F yourself, Dave, anything. <laughs> These guys are great. Okay, right. you've already said it, so I'll start off easy. Classical song. Rite of Spring. Say it again? Rite of Spring. That's my mom's. Pop song. Oh my God! Tough. Name, name like one of your own. Excedrin. Um, toxic. Britney Spears. Toxic. Mm. Oh. I think that is so absolutely brilliant. Max Martin. And Kathy Dennis. Wow. Uh, actually, you know what? That one's not Max. It wasn't Max. I'm a huge Max Martin fan, but that's Me not too. him. It's uh, Kathy and uh, Bloodshy and Avant. Mm. Pop song. Another pop song? You just did pop song. Oh, sorry. <laughs> who's who's sick? I didn't check it. See? Country song. Crazy. Patsy Cline. Nice. Oh, man. Which is a Willie Nelson song. I was about to say that. I was thinking that. That he sold for $50. You're kidding And she me. hated it and didn't want to record it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Um, check mark. Jazz song. Uh, the entire Kind of Blue album, I will pick oh. either So What or Freddie the Freeloader. Wynton Kelly's piano solo and Freddie the Freeloader. Mm. Yeah. Just as an aside, my hero and friend was Dwayne Allman, and that, that plus uh, my favorite things. Coltrane played on that album, and then when Coltrane did his solo album, those were his two favorite records. Listen to Elizabeth Reed. 40s era song. I'll take Big Band or Sinatra or anything in that 40s era. Okay. Uh, I have a lot. My favorite uh, channel on satellite radio is 40s on 4. Me too. Me too. I love Not it. Not my favorite, but... It's, for me, it's my favorite. I can't get over how much I love it. Um, I'm a huge Mills Brothers fan. There's just like, there's everything on that. Um, there's tons of can't, great Count Basie that was done in the 40s. Ooh. I can't come up with one. I, I, I love uh, some of that Woody Herman stuff. Yeah. He's a rock star. Okay, reggae. Oh, um... It's so hard to pick. Uh, Exodus. Bob Marley. Best band maybe ever in the world. Okay. I think. Get, get it together, Greg. This is a little harder now. Okay. Ballad. Did you say... You, at first I thought you said mallet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Southern. I could have. Like. Uh, okay. In English, this time, ballad. Ballad. Uh, you make me feel like a natural woman. Dave. Wow. Oh, there wow. Wow. Huh? <laughs> Did we just have a to play Scoop here? I mean... <laughs> I said, I'm just going to let it... Okay. Let it breathe. Worst song you've ever heard. Oh. It can be one I've mixed. That's okay. Uh, it, it's songs that no one's ever heard of. Like songs I've... One from your album. <laughs> There's a few on there. Um... <laughs> There was, uh, oh, I can't, I can't, no, you can't. I can't you, out this person. It would but be impolitic, as they would say. Yeah, yeah there's, exactly. there's um, amazing. We, we don't, we don't do that. I mean, I, you know, I've written so many unbelievably <laughs> terrible songs. Okay, my friend Max Mel Belladonna came all the way from Italy. He does metal. Your favorite heavy metal song? Mm. I'll take Ozzy. I'll take anything. Uh, I have to say, uh, I, Warhead by Otep. Oh, Ota, I like them. Um, okay, last but not least, in honor of Abbey Road, your favorite Beatles song, mm. one that this audience should study so that it can become Greg Wells in a week or two weeks. Oh, my God. I would go with Yesterday. Anybody with a question for Greg, Dave, or myself? Somebody's coming to you now. There you go. Hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Um, how do you compartmentalize when you're engineering and playing on stuff? I know you work with an engineer, I know that helps. Um, do you kind of separate those two things in your brain, or how does that process work for you as far as getting in the musician mode, getting into the engineer mode, and going back and forth and ping-pong in between those things? Because I think question. that's something a lot Great of people 
do Wait. today? Stop. Great question. Yeah. I'm messing with you. Uh, it's, it's, That's you a know. great question. Anyway, you, you get the idea. It's, it's not easy, and I think I sucked at it for, for quite a while. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I talked about it with these guys before. It's such a struggle to retain objectivity and, and to be able to hear it the way that someone who hasn't been working on it is going to hear it, because that's what you're trying to do. You're not, you're not, you're not, you don't want to preach to the choir, you being the choir and the preacher at the same time. <laughs> you have to... Uh, I'm stealing that. I know, like that. It's, I guess it's like cooking. Like It's got to taste good to other people, you know? Um, this side of the room? Hi. Oh, oh, hello, hello, hello. Okay, thanks. Great, guys. Thanks for being here. I have a question. As a recording engineer, I'm trying to do my best while recording, so I'm compressing, EQing stuff, as, as you just said. And I haven't, it's not an issue, but I have some troubles when it comes to mixing. It always sounds fat and, and big exactly as I want it. And my mixes, I like my, my rough mixes, and my artists like rough mixes. But when it comes to mixing, sometimes it sounds a bit bigger and it doesn't fit into the reverbs and stuff. What, what should I do in this case? Maybe some lo, lo, high Wait. passing, low passing stuff, maybe. Some Is that a, are you talking about a vocal? No, a, every instrument, drums, guitars, bass. So it sounds big and, and it sounds really big and fat. But it, when it comes to mixing... That, it, that's a very difficult question to answer in this format, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can I can I can I try and do an ITL for you maybe? Yeah, it would be great. Well Will, will you remind me to do an ITL on Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. We'll do that. Does anybody want to take a Good shot question. at it? I mean it, it's mixing is really hard. And 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 again I would say certainly many, 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 many mixes I've done were absolute garbage terrible um, and and something I've, I've said again before on this show that Jack Joseph Puig taught me years ago and he does it still even at his you know status he has a playlist of uh, his favorite mixes that other people have done and as he's mixing he will switch inputs and listen to you know in the middle of his mix which can be like a punch in the face if your mix is not good and then you go to something that you know, one of your favorite mixers has mixed that you know sounds amazing. Um, so I had done that for years and that alone is like a master's degree in mixing. If you just do that to your mixes, I'm telling you, it will change. Your, it doesn't happen overnight, but you, there's something in your brain I think yeah. just kind of absorbs balance and then that informs the way you record sounds. You know, there's definitely a world of like, um, you find it less today because of shrinking budgets and people are recording at home more, but I definitely noticed coming up as a studio musician and as a young producer, there were engineers that were sometimes better at recording sounds and not as good at mixing sounds. Rarely did I notice the reverse, but there were amazing tracking engineers and it didn't translate when, when, they, when they would still apply that same stuff to the mix. Not everyone's like that, but um, it's tough. It's tough, it's tough, it's tough, and you've got to keep trying. On this side of the room. I have a, I have a question for both of you guys. Uh, typically, how long do you spend on a typical mix? Um, <laughs> you want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what? It varies. Um, mix... There's a thread that all these questions are sort of fitting into the same thread. Um, would you expect Bill Gates to be a, a great painter? Probably not. Would you expect Picasso to be a great software and code writer? Probably not. What Greg does for a living requires him to be both those people. And so when a mix is very technical, it goes pretty quick. When a mix is all creative, think of this. Sometimes in music, it's it's. Uh, stop me in a minute, Herm, because I'm getting long-winded. When sometimes th in in music, it's better to think metaphorically about something else. So think about you've got a cookbook out, and the recipe is a food you've never tasted. Now you following that recipe, 
and then you taste it and, and you don't know if that's what it should taste like. So the answer to Greg's last que uh, to the question that, that Greg did before about about you know referencing certain things and then our and then our, what we're talking about legends and stuff. If you want to be good at music, you've got to know what's good, and the way you get at what's good is listen. He and I probably listen to more music than any human beings on earth. I, I listen to a lot of music, so knowing what to do is more difficult than knowing how to do it. You can follow the recipe, but if you don't know what the food should taste like, you're screwed. So that's the place to start. Immerse but, but, yourself in music. If that's not fun, then maybe, maybe then, then you're not going to progress. Let me, let me add to that, though, the other side of the equation. So on my side of the equation, as it relates to how long he has to mix, depends on who hires us. So the balance on the other side is that pressure on these guys to fit somebody else's time frame that not might fit their creative process. So Dave may get to perfection in a mix or Greg in producing a song in five days, but the guys want it in two. So there's a pressure on them that has to be brought to them in certain ways to either speed up, slow down, be left alone. Sometimes I have to take the bullet, sometimes he has to take the bullet. So that process is never comfortable. There's a creative tension to it that sometimes actually makes them greater by working under the gun, and sometimes you have to ease that back. So there's a real balance between the sort of left brain, business creative kind of component. Her, Question her, on this let me, side. Let me do one little thing. One, one more thing. We're going to have time. Uh, that's, so that's, get in that's not my problem. This is no, important. It, it is your problem. We're going to be out of time. If, a tra if something's really extremely well recorded, you can mix it faster. If it's, if it's poorly recorded, it takes longer. No one ever finishes a mix. You run out of time. Uh, Lauren, Mar Lauren Michaels with Saturday Night Live, they asked him, how do you get a show a week done? And he said, well, I, I don't try to do the, a great show. I try to do the best show I can in a week. There's a component to that in mixing, too. Now, at home, you've got the luxury of taking a year, so you should do better than me. So on this side. Hi, I have a question. Uh, on the producer end, uh, when you're working with a new artist establishing a relationship, are there any common, out, common uh, things that you're seeing yourself do you know, when uh, de de developing a relationship? Cho for everything from choosing a mic or just getting to know their catalog? or What kind of things do you normally do to get to know the artists before you start working with them? That's, it's really important. It's really, w w the most important thing is trust. So you know, it, ha it has to start with some commonality of I, I have to like their music or, or there's no point in us even talking about working together because I wouldn't know what to do with it if, I don't, if it doesn't speak to me and it would be a waste of their money to hire me. So it starts there. And, and I'm always kind of surprised at, at the varying degrees that I connect personally with someone whose music I like and sometimes I don't. Uh, and sometimes it's even like, like I really don't, you know? And it's, that's a weird one. Um, I, I go out of my way because I know how terrifying it is to stand on a mic, because I did try it, you know, briefly, um, and sing. I mean, it's scary sitting here talking to you guys. I'm nervous, you know. So I mean, imagine thinking, like, your audience is just a mic, and there's two people listening to you, and potentially thousands, millions of people are going to hear whatever you do, and the pressure. So um, that's the prime thing I go for. Um, and I want the artist to know that I'm not a suit. I'm not a pawn for the record label. I work for the artist. Now, the record label is advancing the artist their, the artist's money to hire me. The record label is signing that check. But the artist is really in charge, and the labels are probably not going to be very happy with me saying that, but it's true. We all work for the artist. The management, the label, me, everyone. Um, artists are often made to not feel that way, but we'd all be sunk without great artists and great songwriters. Uh, so I just try to acknowledge the reality of that. And, uh, and, and I've actually become really good friends with a lot of artists that I work with, even from years and years and years back. Um, and sometimes that doesn't pan out, or sometimes we've had a more combative experience making the record, and then we become friends after the record. That's happened several times. It's different every time. But trust is, is really important, I, I find. So on this side first. <laughs> you, uh, this question is for Dave. Out of all the artists that you, that you work with, who's your favorite? 
Me? Yeah. Herb Charlie. Uh, Lionel Richie, and followed closely by uh, Will Smith. Um, and the, the reason is more important than the artist. Um, they just they just make you feel special somehow. Like like uh, like what Greg was saying. That some people you work for, some people you work with, some people. But Lionel was pretty special, and I didn't expect that. And Will Smith was pretty special, and I didn't expect that. And in some ways, they're all your favorite, but, but those guys became friends, you know? This side, one more. How do you go, right now I'm working with just independent bands on labels and things like that. How do you go from working with those kind of bands to bigger bands that are on major labels or even yeah, just independent labels? Sure. Um, I mean, that's, that's how I started. I did tons and tons and tons of indie records. We'll talk later. Um, I think you just, just always try to do the best work you can possibly do. And when that starts to connect, then word will get out and just keep doing that. Keep your nose down and, you know, every once in a while, uh, as someone once said to me, the fickle finger of fate will go bloop and it might happen once, it might happen 15 times. Here, here's a good example of that if I can. Remember my, my spiel about service, right? So this show, which, which by the way, we thank you for the support of the show, came about out of a medical incident and an idea on how to work smarter, and the fickle finger of fate touched us in such a way we had no clue. But what we did do, which Dave will tell you and I'll tell you, is we took whatever opportunity it was, and we didn't know for a long time what it was, really seriously. And we tried to do it excellently. And we tried to do it outside the box. Because at this stage of the game, we know that that's our requirement. So it's just, we don't have the luxury of not doing it that way. And so we just put our heads down. We didn't know where we were going. There's a famous conversation that Dave and I had called the kitchen conversation <laughs> behind his kitchen. We were looking at each other going, I don't know, man. Well, let's take the shot. And we didn't see this. We saw something else. So we just stepped up, did it in service. Somebody asked me coming over here, do you get stopped? And I get all the time. And what they say is, you help me so much. The show helps me so much. Thanks so much. I mean, it's amazing. So at your level, we're still doing it at our level. So always push the envelope, always reach. Somebody will notice, and somebody will take you there. Let me say something really quick. It, the answer to that question changed about five years ago because there's this little thing that's introduced us to, to you, and that's the Internet. So it's a different world. The old books, the old concepts don't work anymore. You've got a great advantage because... You are the record company now. You are the major now. Yep, yep. So take it seriously. Look, guys, we got to wrap it up in terms of official stuff. Stick around if you want to ask us questions and so on and so forth. We want to thank you much. We're going to have Greg say goodbye, but first of all, we're going to have Dave say goodbye, but first of all, give Greg Wells a great round of applause for being here. How about these guys? These guys. Uh, this show. Look, look, look what they're doing. Uh, incredible. Uh, we certainly thank you. We are touched at the bottom of our heart. Dave, take us home and then say okay. goodbye. Guys, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm stunned. I thought maybe five or six people would show up, and thank you so much. It's been a blast. We, 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 we tried to get in a lot today. When this airs, check it out, because there's a lot of good information here. I, I learned sitting in front of Greg. I'm a huge fan of Greg's. I've worked with him. I've had his tracks in my hand. I've mixed for him. This guy is incredible. Everything he says is a course in itself, every sentence. And uh, please come back tomorrow. And you guys watching this at home, we'll see you very, very, very soon. Yeah.